I'm a lecturer in Visual Culture of Science and Medicine at the University of Aberdeen and I would like uh, to thank Louis very much for inviting me to this laser talk. Um, and I have to say that um, I didn't quite know how to really start with the topic of liminality. So the first thing I've done is actually simple, uh, you know, do a little bit of really basic research on how we uh, understand really the very word liminality. And obviously, liminality uh, comes from the Latin word limen, which means threshold. So a place, a time, a body, a being, a situation can all be uh, liminal. And to be at a threshold, I would say, is really not an easy a task, is not an easy position. Um, liminality, um, it has to do with the being in between. And it is a condition that is somehow filled up with ambiguities, with contradictions, but also with potentialities. Because I think that the main point of uh, liminality is that it is a condition in which transformations can take place and can happen. Um, it's quite interesting that the term, as a concept, liminality was introduced by uh, the ethnologist Arnold van Gennep in his uh, work, uh, um, The Rites of Passage. This is the uh, English translation of this uh, 1909 work. And he uh, was analyzing different uh, rites of passages. From, for instance, the moment of transition between uh, from childhood to adulthood. And he identified in all these rites of passage, passages um, a basic pattern, a common pattern, which um, was characterized by three phases, separation, liminality, and incorporation. And I would like you to really keep those three phases in mind because they will come back. Um, so this was really my kind of starting point, and I kind of tried to relate a little bit the concept of liminality to what I'm actually currently researching. Um, I'm interested in uh, visual culture of science and medicine, and I would say that I'm interested in liminal states, in liminal works, in liminal projects that sit in between art and science. In particular, I'm interested in exploring how images and, and different kinds of visualizations um, within the biomedical uh, sciences, biomedical physics, uh, most of all, um, are actually created, interpreted and displayed inside the scientific laboratory. And I'm interested in looking uh, so at, on the one hand, at how scientists work with images um, and other types of visualizations, um, in the sense uh, of not just of using images to illustrate a scientific topic or an argument, but in the sense of really doing science through images. Um, I'm also interested in asking the question of what happens when these images, which, you know, these visualizations migrate from the laboratory to the wider uh, cultural arena, to mass media, but also to uh, the art world. Um, and today I'm going to really, um, not to give a systematic talk or to offer you, um, you know, uh, like the answer on, of, you know, on what liminality might mean in my research, but I'm going to offer you a few examples of uh, the really material, uh, somehow, objects or images that I'm interested in and that I've been working on. Um, and in particular, I'm going to focus on really a couple of moments from the that belong to the history of uh, magnetic resonance imaging. And as you might know, magnetic resonance imaging is one of the cutting edge uh, biomedical imaging techniques, so which is used to visualize the interior of the body and of the brain, both in terms of structure and function. Um, what I do normally is that I work within archives and I work doing uh, you know, ethnographic field work within the lab to really understand how scientists work uh, to develop a new um, biomedical imaging technique. And the history of MRI is really uh, transnational because it is also liminal if you want. It sits and it really uh, um, shifts across different places and different times, different also laboratories. It uh, stretches from uh, you know, the UK to the US to Asia. 
And today I'm going to focus on a very peripheral moment in this broader history, which is again, which took place at the University of Aberdeen in the Biomedical Physics Department from the uh, um, middle 1960s until the early 1980s, at the time of John Mallard, one of the physicists who played a, a huge role in, um, in the, the development of magnetic resonance imaging as a clinically useful tool. So this is really the Aberdonian, if you want, uh, um, uh, perspective and contribution to the history. And um, in my research, I'm interested in exploring those kind of images. Uh, I'm interested in exploring uh, the, 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 the how data are turned into images before the visualization pipeline is black boxed, before uh, you know it becomes a standard. So this is what, what you're looking at, what you think you're looking at here. A mouse. <laughs> A mouse, it's actually a, a mouse with a broken neck, actually. So it's a dead mouse with a broken neck. <laughs> You're looking at the first ever, the world first ever, clinically useful MRI image of a mouse displaying the so-called T1 parameter, relaxation time information, um, that was created again by John Mallard and his team. And I, um, I got really interested in this uh, image um, because obviously it, is, it plays a crucial role because it really opened up the pathway toward the clinical use, the clinical application of, of MRI. Um, what is interesting is that the matrix of numbers, so the raw data uh, of these T1 values, uh, was printed out on paper and then was hand painted. So this was an image created before, uh, you know, powerful computers were actually uh, available. And what is interesting is that this image is actually quite useful to somehow introduce us or to bring us uh, to the topic of liminality. If you uh, look at the contours, the contours, the black line, is an artistic license. The colors were chosen to highlight the different areas, the anatomical areas of the mouse and the physiological changes that were taking place. For instance, the black shows uh, really the, the, the region of the neck of the mouse where uh, you know, the edema um, uh, um, uh, took place, so where the um, animal's neck had been broken, basically. So, um, this mouse image, which is really a map, I would say, sits in between mimesis and convention. It is realistic and it is artificial at the same time. And I'm actually uh, quite interested in uh, the, the reference to the you know, uh, true to nature uh, value of the images, which is a concept that uh, Gallison uh, put forward um, uh, together with, uh, with um, Loren Destin. And actually, this is an example of an image that somehow corresponds to the third category that Gallison mentioned in his work, which is trained judgment, <laughs> which has to do with the idea that scientists are actually not only relying on you know, a mechanical means of reproduction, for instance, photography or you know, other ways of actually reproducing mechanically nature but they are increasingly relying on you know, their ability to actually you know, read the image, to make sense of the image. So trained judgment is uh, an important category and another way of thinking about what objectivity means uh, within the scientific laboratory. So um, this image is interesting and it is liminal because it embodies both the numerical, the measurement value of this type of biomedical images and the role played by aesthetics. It embodies uh, the dichotomy between images and numbers that is a red thread running across the whole history of biomedical imaging. As you know, um, physicists are not interested generally in images, they need numbers. Um, radiologists, on the other hand, need images, but they were not interested in that type of image because they were used to black and white images, you know, obtained with x-rays and not with this type of colorful picture. 
But the reason why Mallard and his team decided to actually you know, publish the results of their research using adding colors, these kind of striking colors, almost uh, like pop art, I would say, colors, was that uh, Mallard was really convinced that um, the use of color was crucial to enhance, to improve the flow of information. So really to improve actually the reading in the eye and the brain of the observer. This is the, really the locution that he uses in, uh, in many of his writings. And it was with that image of the mouse with the broken neck that Mallard was able to convince um, you know, stakeholders and also uh, clinicians of the necessity of scaling up from the image of the mouse, from an instrument, a technology that would be able to, you know, uh, um, uh, image a mouse, to a full body human scanner. So there was really a, a, a process of scaling up from the dead mouse to the full human body in all its aliveness and also in all its, you know, uh, uh, somehow uh, um, uh, difficulties. <laughs> And, and it was in 1980 that Mark I, the first, again, the world's first whole body MRI scanner used for clinical purposes, was, was constructed really hands-on from uh, you know, the physicists and the engineers working in the biomedical physics laboratory in, in Aberdeen. And again, this is an object that we are used to kind of, it looks like a Star Trek, <laughs> almost space shuttle, I think. And it's quite interesting that the two postdoc researchers who were really crucial, you know, within the uh, Mahler team, um, were the ones who invented the so-called spin warp method, which is uh, still nowadays used. Uh, and it's the method that enables really the translation from raw data into images. So it's a worldwide standard nowadays. And it was called spin warp method, if I remember correctly, really in honor of uh, uh, Star Trek. <laughs> so, um, what, uh, what I've done basically is also um, I've tried to uh, consider this object, this you know, prototype, this first scanner, as a boundary object, as a liminal object again, that really sits in between uh, spaces and times. And I'll, I'll just explain you very briefly why. And the, the imprints of Mark I are still visible nowadays in the lab, where scientists are now developing a new uh, type of biomedical imaging technology, which is called um, fast field cycling. So we, you still encounter the story and the history of really this technology if you go to the lab. But it has also been reconstructed, really rebuilt and put on display within the uh, Sati Art Center, which is an art gallery. So it's quite interesting because Mark I now has become an object, a boundary object that really um, enables the encounter, if you want, and the communication between different communities, that of clinicians, researchers, the lay public, um, and also between, again, between times. So um, this is really uh, uh, somehow what I always tend to do. So I tend to look at the materiality of uh, you know, of, of, of science in the making, if you want. I don't stop at analyzing the final visual output. In this case, for instance, you know, scans of the body or brain scans. I tend to, uh, you know, be interested in really opening up again this black box somehow in studying how the technology itself was actually being constructed and what were the frictions and the problems, the challenges that were encountered. Um, in, my, in my research, I um, have been looking as well, as I told you at the beginning, I've been interested in you know, following somehow the journeys of these images, uh, of also these kind of visualizations from the laboratory to the artwork. And for instance, I've been focusing quite a lot on a number of artists who have been using, for instance, brain scans uh, in their artwork, in their art, uh, um, in their art. Uh, and an example that you, I'm sure that you uh, know very well is the work uh, made by the Portuguese artist Marta de Menezes, who developed a series of functional portraits uh, using functional MRI. In this case, she was actually uh, interested in investigating this, uh, you know, 
ambiguity uh, related to uh, functional brain scans. She was portraying Martin Kemp, the famous art historian who wrote a lot about also art and science, while watching a painting. The painting was The Ambassadors by Hans Holbein. And obviously Martin Kemp was actually not watching at the real painting, but he was probably looking at a photographic reproduction. Um, but again, this is a way of really uh, exploring uh, the, the kind of limits of those technologies and of trying to incorporate some of the images that are created by scientists into, into, an, art, uh, into an artwork. The artist that I'm going to, um, to really to, to show, to talk a little bit uh, today, to really uh, in, uh, in, in the time left, is William Pendridge. And I'm willing to show you just three minutes from one of his films, um, because I think that although uh, the film that I'm going to show you has been done, uh, you know, is not a recent work, <laughs> it has been done um, uh, a few years ago, I think he's still, uh, his work, his way of working with medical imaging technologies, and in particular with brain scans and also with the uh, apparatus with the imagery raised by uh, biomedical technologies is quite, quite unique, really. Just to give you a few information, William Kendridge was born in 1955 in Johannesburg, South Africa. He was the son of uh, two anti-apartheid lawyers. He studied politics uh, and African studies, art and drama. So he had Jewish origin um, in combination with being a South African male of Eastern European descent. So, and I think his, his really his position, his personal history is quite interesting to, to explore the way in which he really uh, explored the concept of liminality in his, in his work, also using uh, medical imaging technologies. Um, in an essay, Kentridge described apartheid as a rock that cannot be moved. And he said that to escape this rock is the job of the artist. So, being highly affected by the political situation of his country, he really used his art practice as a means to set himself aside, really, from the given social system. He used, uh, and he still use, uses many different techniques and media in his work, but in general, his main um, work focuses on animation, on the, uh, the so-called technique of drawings for projection. Um, an interest Oops. An interesting point before I show you really the short clip but is to, um, to kind of um, just remember that in his work there are many recurring themes and, uh, and uh, topics. Um, Kentridge is interesting for instance in exploring uh, the theme of the double. In all his work or at least in, you know, in some of his work you actually can find um, uh, the, the, the use of alter egos. And the use of alter egos is really a way of embodying his own, actually, liminal being. The fact that he is also in between. An example from the film that I'm going to show you, which is Waiting and Wanting, uh, part of the epic cycle, Nine Drawings for Projection, is really the use of the two main characters, the two alter egos, Soho and Felix. And they represent two different and conflicting sides of his personality. Soho is the greedy industrialist who lacks an inner and emotional life. And Felix is the complete opposite. He's really the gentle, the poetic soul who overflows with feelings. I'm going to show you um, now. say of um, which blends the internal landscape within exterior landscape. Thank <laughs> you. 
I'll finish here um, with the film and I'll just wrap up. And so Kendridge is really interested in correlating the use of you know, structural and functional MRI scans to the idea of excavating memories, forgotten and repressed histories. So the idea of really blending the psychological interior landscape with the exterior landscape uh, in all its history, with a landscape that is both built by humans and also natural. Um, it's quite interesting to pay attention to the fact that he also uses the oral component of the scanner, which is actually often overlooked by many artists who have been working with uh, these type of images. So the oral dimension, if you undergo an MRI, is actually very powerful, even if you are given the headphones. Uh, and I would say that um, he really uh, uses uh, the, uh, the metaphor of the brain as a rock, actually. So remember that the rock is the symbol of the apartheid. Um, slices of Soho brains are, showing, are shown merging into memories of landscapes. So brain scans can expose a subject's memories, fantasies, dreams, and sorrows. Um, but uh, let's say that uh, Kendridge is really not interested in conducting a criticism of, I don't know, the reductionism of neurosciences or of biomedical uh, science. He's not interested in offering us a theory of a unified self. But he's, and, and why I'm saying that? I'm saying that because he constantly uh, draws and then erases the images he creates. So. Um, it seems to really rethink, to conclude, the three phases of separation, transition, and incorporation that I mentioned in reference to Van Gennep's work on liminality. So the post-colonial era uh, that South Africa uh, lives in can be regarded as a liminal era where a new identity has not yet been fully formed. South Africa is in a transitional liminal phase. Its past identity is slowly being deconstructed and the ideas and knowledge to understand and build also its future identity are still very much uh, in progress. And to conclude really, the interesting also point of, of this particular work is that Kentridge is not focusing just on the individual brain, on the individual subject, but on the collective subject as a way of saying that our personal, really deep personal histories become embodied in the collective history of a country. So I think this is really how it tries to uh, really uh, explore uh, somehow the idea of liminality. Thank you very much.